All right, it is 12.01. Good morning, everyone. Happy Monday and happy month of May. Can you believe this year is flying by so, so very quickly? And today actually is the Rotary Club of Harrisburg's 110th birthday. So uh, we're so excited um, about that. But um, let's kick our meeting off today with an invocation from Carolyn Dumaresk. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Please um, pray with me. Thank you, Lord, for another beautiful day and the health to enjoy it. Please bless, bless whatever food we are eating to uh, us and to your service. Amen. Thank you, Carolyn. And today's song by special request is America the Beautiful, and it is being performed by Beyonce. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies. For amber ways of rain, for purple mountain majesties above the fruit. Thank you, Adeline. Great rendition of that tune. Would you join me in the pledge, uh, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And join me in the four-way test of all the things we think, say, and do. First, is it the truth? 
Second, is it fair to all concerned? Third, will it build goodwill and better friendships? And fourth, will it be beneficial to all concerned? A few quick notes. Uh, first, thank you so much to Sam Levine for uh, taking minutes of our meeting today. Make sure you remember the four-way test, Sam, as you're taking those minutes. Tonight is our club's 110th birthday party. 110 birthdays under the belt. Rotary Club of Harrisburg, we are going to have fun tonight. Six o'clock p.m. at the Hilton. And uh, for folks who RSVP'd, we are looking forward to seeing you there at six. We had a great day of service at the Susquehanna Harbor Safe Haven on Saturday afternoon. Now you may remember that the day of service was part of the district conference, the Rotary District Conference, and actually our very own Una Martone did a phenomenal presentation on how to have better Zoom meetings. I'm just nervous this morning because Una is on the call. And anyway, so I'm nervous this morning. All right. But we had a great day of service. And right there, smack dab in the middle of that group is our very own president-elect, Matt Staub, looking larger than life. There is a short story to that. And if you think to ask Matt, you know, how it came to be that he needed to be Photoshopped into that picture, just reach out and I'm sure he'll be happy to share that story with you. So many things going on here in the Rotary Club of Harrisburg, great opportunities to be involved. The Peace Garden Spring Planting is coming up on May 15th. Make sure you register to be a part of that event. Uh, the 17th of May, we have a service project. Again, we'll be packing boxes of food for the Central Pennsylvania Food Bank. You know, we are going to exceed 2000 boxes of food this year. So let's get out and keep making it happen. And uh, be sure to volunteer as well at Arts Fest. To get signed up for any of these events, either click on the link that you find in your Rotary Roundup delivered to your email every Friday, or go out to the Rotary Club of Harrisburg website and click on the events calendar. So as I was being coached, for this meeting and what to say and what not to say, I really wanted to say there's a foundation board meeting, a Rotary, a Harrisburg Rotary Foundation board meeting also listed on that event. Maybe not so much fun as the other events, but if you're a board member, make sure you show up for that meeting. All right. We are collecting donations for the Harrisburg or for the Rotary Foundation. You know, usually we ask for a hundred dollars, but Heck, you know, if you can give 25, if you can give 10, give something to the Rotary Foundation. Your dollars help to do a lot of good in the world. Now, if you get your donation in by May 31st, then your name will go in a drawing and you can be featured on a billboard that looks just like this one. The drawing will take place at our service on a Monday event on June 7th. Remember, May 17th is our club's annual meeting. So if you'd like to vote to approve the slate of officers that you see in front of you here, make sure that you are present in our annual club meeting on Monday, May 17th. Getting involved. You know, joining a committee and just kind of working with some other people, some other Rotarians to really make a difference in the world is a great way to A, make a difference, and B, get connected to folks on a different level. So on the Rotary Club of Harrisburg website, on the Get Involved button, you have a drop down there, click where it says Join a Committee. And all the committees in our club will come up. So if you have questions about a particular committee and what they do, just reach out to the committee chair and schedule some time or a phone call or a meeting to hear all about what that committee does in our club and our community. 
a great big thank you to our corporate members, Capital Blue Cross, UPMC, Highmark, Hospice of Central Pennsylvania, and the Harrisburg Regional Chamber and Credic. Your support helps us to carry out the many humanitarian projects that we work on throughout the course of each Rotary year. So we thank you for your ongoing support. And today we continue our Meet the Board Member series. Well, you know, she's not quite a board member, but she is so integral to this club. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now presenting her birthday today, actually. She's a Rotary rock star. The Rotary Public Club Administrator. Adeline, would you make her welcome in our meeting here this morning? Oh, thank you so much, James. I'm so excited to take a few minutes and share a little bit about myself today. Uh, so most of you know of me as Adeline, the Rotary Woman. Um, I do pretty much eat, sleep, and breathe Rotary. Um, I'm currently involved in three different Rotary clubs. Um, of course, I've been a member of the Harrisburg Keystone Rotary Club since 2012. Uh, my husband and I consult for the Rotary Club of Baltimore, and of course, I've been a member of the leadership team here for almost three years now. And before you all offered me my dream job, I worked a lot of other cool jobs while I went to school for business administration and accounting. Um, technically, I'm still working my way through college. Um, I worked in the accounting department at, at a CPA firm, at Sony Chemicals Corporation, uh, Walt Disney World Resorts. And then I settled down at New Cumberland Federal Credit Union, uh, where I worked for 11 years in various positions there. Uh, one of my favorite parts about working at the credit union was the Pennsylvania Credit Union Young Professionals Network, which spanned all across Pennsylvania. Um, and that was through the Pennsylvania Credit Union Association, which is now called Cross State. Um, I was heavily involved in this program for about five years, and it gave me some incredible opportunities, um, including the state's executive leadership fellowship, uh, which is a seven year program for up and coming credit union CEOs. Uh, I continue to serve the credit union association by providing financial counseling for folks coming out of the departments of correction system. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I joined the Harrisburg Keystone Rotary Club in 2012. Uh, what attracted me to that club was a combination of the fun activities that I otherwise would not have been adventurous enough to do on my own, uh, such as kayaking on the Susquehanna River. Uh, I learned a lot about the city of Harrisburg through our programming and service work. Uh, we do some great fundraisers like the 0.5K and the Capital City Cornhole Classic. I had the privilege of serving as club president twice. Uh, we normally have between 25 and 30 active club members, um, but I, I really hit my stride in my second term as club president. I just loved being president. And that year we won all the awards at district conference. Uh, yeah, a lot of fun. Uh, so some of our projects that we continue to do, uh, we maintain the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial on the, on the Capitol area Greenbelt, as well as uh, the monument in Riverfront Park that honors the sacrifice and service of women in Harrisburg during the Great War. And um, about a month ago, we had spent a year um, organizing uh, a vision clinic for, and we provided eye screenings and glasses for 50 patients. And the past few years, I've been captain of the Polar Plunge team, which raises money for the local Special Olympics. So what that involves is jumping in a frozen lake at Gifford Pinchot State Park. 
but this year we had to do it a little bit differently because it wasn't safe to do to be in a large group. So uh, this year was more like an ice bucket challenge. Uh, but we made it work and we raised nearly $800 for the Special Olympics. And uh, just so you know, my son JD is a Special Olympics athlete. So that's why it's one of my passions. And speaking of passions, this is my husband, Josh. And this is our family. Uh, my stepson, Gabriel, is 15. He's a freshman at Dover Middle School. My daughter, Sophie, is 13, and she's in seventh grade at Camp Hill Middle School. And my little guy, JD, is nine, and he's in third grade at Eisenhower Elementary. And when I'm not doing rotary, uh, I spend a lot of time on my patio. I love building campfires. I find it to be very therapeutic. And when it gets warmer, I'm looking forward to tubing and kayaking on the Yellow Breaches Creek. It's one of my favorite outdoor activities. And I hope you've enjoyed learning a little bit more about me today. If you want to get me to get to know me even better, you know, hit me up, buy me a beer. I'd love to hang out. Back to you, James. Thank you, Adeline. We appreciate you and um, all that you do um, in our club to keep the rotary wheel turning. Thank you. And it's so good to hear about, you know, some other uh, other clubs in the, in the area. Um, great people all through Rotary. Speaking of people we appreciate, program committee member extraordinaire, Mary Oliveira is one of those people that, you know, the more you get to know her, the more you appreciate. And Mary today is going to be introducing today's speaker. Mary. Thank you, President James. Uh, you make me blush, so I appreciate those kind words. Uh, and I'm so very excited to bring our guest to our club today. I think a very relevant topic and uh, some incredible information hopefully we can all walk away from today's session with. Uh, for those of you who may or may not know George Fernandez, uh, once you meet him, you definitely want to. Uh, at the tender age of eight years old, George moved here to the Harrisburg area from the Dominican Republic, which is where he's joining us today from as well. He came with his siblings and his mother, uh, who was a single mom and did not speak English at the time. So uh, George had to quickly learn how to navigate life here in America to help his, his family uh, overcome all the barriers that made their life a little bit of a challenge as they absorb themselves into this new culture and home. After college, George embarked on a career in the hospitality industry only to move uh, pretty quickly into the healthcare industry. In the role he served to help his organization's 5.4 million members understand and navigate health insurance coverage. And it was during this career path that he recognized a very critical thing, that the growing Latino community was drastically underserved in many areas, including healthcare, education, and employment services. And so with this realization and uh, the support of his family and friends, George stepped out on his own, stepped away from the corporate world and decided to turn a lifelong dream of helping others into reality. So in 2014, he founded the Latino Connection. It is a strategic communications firm that helps organizations serve the Spanish speaking community, both in Pennsylvania, as well as on a national platform. The company possesses a dual mission to effectively connect clients with their Latino stakeholders and to deliver high quality translation and interpretation services. With George at the helm, the Latino Connection has served millions of Latinos and hundreds of organizations, maximize their reach and protect one another. Clients range from private sector businesses to nonprofit entities and government agencies. And George will share the most recent example of that, I'm sure, in his remarks in just a few moments. Since its inception, the Latino Connection has been certified by the Eastern Minority Suppliers Diversity Council and is recognized as a Hispanic business enterprise by the United States Hispanic Chamber of Commerce as well. George is a servant leader at heart. He remains heavily involved in the local community, is an LHA alum, and is 
incredibly <laughs> charged with so many other organizations uh, and has been uh, the recipient of many prestigious honors, including the Jefferson Award and Central Pennsylvania Business Journal's 40 Under 40. George is a dreamer and a doer, and behind him and his army of team members at the Latino Connection, they are an advocate and inspiration for the Latino community. He combines his authentic personal life experiences with a passion to communicate and serve others. And this is what he does for the community here and beyond. He is my friend. I'm happy to introduce to you, uh, George Fernandez. Thank you so much, Mary. Wow, Mary, that was beautiful. I was worried um, I wasn't going to have a cool introduction like Adeline's. I was over here dancing my butt off. Um, thank you so much, Mary. Thank you so much uh, to the Rotary Club for inviting me to speak today. Um, I really appreciate you, Mary, you know, putting the personal touch in my introduction. Um, I, as a product of a single mother of three, um, my mother never qualified for social and human services because she was essentially an immigrant uh, who was also a victim of domestic violence. And um, I recall uh, the period that we lived, at the, at the short period of two weeks that we lived at the YWCA uh, in Harrisburg. And um, that organization sort of became sort of like the passport for my mom uh, to start a new life in, in, in Harrisburg. And um, I've been living in Harrisburg since 1998. Um, with my with my career at Highmark, I had the blessing of traveling to 41 states across the country and uh, really seeing a lot of our beautiful America. Uh, but yet I still chose to live in Harrisburg. It's a, it's a great place to be and I'm humbled and honored to uh, be a part of your presentation today. Um, so like Mary said, uh, Latino Connection, we are essentially a social de determinants of health, marketing and communications outreach agency. And we basically help community, business, education, healthcare, and government entities understand effective ways and build strategic solutions uh, to reach the growing demographic of predominantly the Hispanic community, but also the LGBT community, the African American community, and so forth. Um, I believe Adeline has a presentation of mine that she should be able to share here very shortly. But really, I want to focus today on sharing um, one of our biggest success uh, that is uh, very time relevant. Uh, last year, at the peak of the pandemic, um, during uh, April of last year, uh, the news broke out that Hispanic and African Americans were dying at higher disproportionate rates than any other dem than any other ethnic demographic group across the country. And at that point in time, I had a crazy wild idea. My friend Mary says, George, be careful what you wish for. I wish I would have listened to her. Um, but I had the crazy idea of calling at that time our secretary of the Department of Health, uh, the, the award-winning, renowned, world-renowned uh, Dr. Rachel Levine. And we came up with the idea of launching a COVID-19 mobile testing unit that would go into low-income, um, neighborhoods and communities and essentially provide COVID-19 testing. Uh, social determinants of health um, is, is created by different foundations and different pillars. And one of the foundations of that term of social determinants of health um, is to meet people where they are. Um, and, um, you know, there are things that we on this call take for granted um, through some of our um, health and wellness programming that we offer at Latino Connection. Um, we go out into neighborhoods and basically educate people on how to live healthier, more active, engaged lives. And um, one of the scenarios that really hit me early on at the stage of Latino Connection was we would go out and, and partner with local food banks and um, we would uh, give out free produce and, you know, free veggies and things like that. And I remember um, meeting a, a teenager um, who left behind um, amazing uh, fruits in the box that was given to him that day. And there were uh, kiwis and strawberries in that box. And I said, you don't want this? Um, you don't want your kiwis? And he said, what's that? He, he didn't know what a kiwi was at the age of 13. Um, and um, the mother said, we don't, we, don't, we don't use that at home. And I said, well, how come? And um, I said, you just throw this stuff in a blender and make a really healthy smoothie. And um, they, they, they didn't have a blender at home. Um, so those are things that us on this call, you know, most likely are, are tools that we have in our kitchen. 
uh, but let alone uh, very many people who are, who are our own neighbors and friends, literally in, in Harrisburg, don't have these types of resources in their kitchen. So I share that example because these were already communities that had an uphill battle against food insecurity, nutrition, and so forth. And then you add COVID to it, and um, it just it just sets them back much much further. Uh, so this mobile unit that we created um, is affectionately affectionately named Kate, and Kate stands for Community Accessible Testing and Education. And Dr. Levine and Governor Wolf believed in our vision, believed in my vision, along with my team of launching this health and wellness mobile unit uh, that is affectionately named Kate. Um, next slide. Uh, the, the entire basis of Kate was to essentially go into these community-based settings and to essentially share facts to erase fear. Um, so our team of community health workers um, basically go out into these community-based settings. And um, last year, we were able uh, to provide um, education to over 20,000 plus individuals. We were able to put uh, hand sanitizers and, and literally masks just like this one into people's hands. Um, and, you know, again, just like I said, something like a blender that we take for granted, we were meeting folks who didn't, didn't even have a mask or could not afford to buy disposable masks. So we were literally putting those resources into uh, the hands of those folks that uh, truly needed them the most. Um, we were able to administer uh, approximately over 3,000 plus uh, COVID-19 tests within our first few weeks of launching the initiative. Uh, last year, and uh, most recently, as of April 12th, um, uh, we started to administer vaccines in partnership with the Pennsylvania Department of Health and the newly uh, named Secretary Allison Beam. Um, in just shy of our first week or so, we've already administered over 2,700 vaccines uh, to very hard to reach populations. Um, some of these community members that we that we visited, uh, we visited a mushroom farm in Berks County, where 92% of um, that workforce worked throughout the pandemic, um, and most of those folks uh, were elderly. Um, we met folks who were literally in their early 60s. Uh, we even met some folks who were into their 70s, and we were also able to vaccinate their family members. Uh, we met a, a beautiful young lady uh, by, uh, by the name of uh, Consuelo, and uh, she was 92 years old. Um, and um, this type of work is extremely fulfilling for me. It's extremely fulfilling to reach people that look like my mother. It's extremely fulfilling to reach uh, folks who do not speak the English language. Uh, folks who can't go to the hospital because they don't have an ID uh, to register. And these are folks who also do not have access to an internet, let alone they can't read or write. But yet they work throughout the pandemic to be able to um, provide the fruits and vegetables that all of us buy at our friendly, you know, giant food stores per se. Um, so this is a very fulfilling type of work and a very fulfilling type of initiative uh, to be a part of. Next slide. Uh, here's a picture of Kate. Uh, Kate is a big girl. Uh, she is 40 feet long, uh, roughly about 14 feet tall and about nine feet wide or so. Uh, she runs on both gasoline and diesel. And um, the mobile unit is fully uh, self-equipped with PPE. It's equipped with a vaccine refrigerator. Um, and we basically drive into these low-income um, neighborhoods and um, provide, currently are providing COVID-19 vaccines. Um, the week that we started, we were supposed to be administering Johnson & Johnson. Uh, April 12th was a Monday. We administered uh, Johnson and Johnson that day, and April thirteenth was that morning when the Johnson and Johnson pause uh, became effective, and that pause became effective roughly about forty five minutes before my event was supposed to start at that mushroom farm with six hundred and fifty plus people in line uh, before eight a.m. and we were able to pivot very quickly thanks to our friends at Highmark and thanks to our friends at Penn State Health. We were able to, to keep the event moving forward and we were able to administer Moderna vaccines. 
Um, so the mobile unit does go back roughly about 28 to 40 days later uh, to administer that second dose of Moderna vaccines. Uh, so we're really excited to be operating this mobile unit across 66 counties in Pennsylvania. We've already visited roughly around seven or eight different counties since April 12th, um, but we clearly have a long way to go. We are currently on stop today. We are currently on stop number 12 out of a 120 mobile tour. So we clearly have a long way to go. Um, and several of those stops have already uh, occurred um, in, in, in our very own county, Dauphin County. Um, and starting here very soon, uh, towards the end of May, Latino Connection in partnership with Dauphin County Human Services will be launching an additional mobile unit uh, to help to vaccinate the homeless in Dauphin County and the organizations that also work with um, homeless and human and social services. So we're really excited to be doing this type of work. Next slide. Here's another uh, a, a shot of Kate. Um, we didn't, I think, I think we included some pictures where you see some people, but we didn't want to include too many pictures just to help keep the privacy of the, of the folks that were, you know, attending um, these events essentially uh, to get vaccinated. Next slide. Here's a picture of our very own uh, Secretary Allison Beam um, on the day of the launch. Uh, Secretary Allison Beam and the Pennsylvania Department of Health have provided Latino Connection uh, with, a, with a grant in the amount of $1.8 million to be able to do this type of work. Um, and we're really excited that Latino Connection is the first uh, minority type of organization to receive this type of funding to be able to do this type of work. Uh, the Pennsylvania Department of Health um, currently funds one mobile unit across the state and this is it. Uh, it's, it's, it's essentially Kate. Next slide. Um, currently, we offer uh, registrations, we offer pre-registrations available online. Um, most of these mobile vaccination events are currently reaching roughly around 300 people per day. Some events are a little bit bigger than others. Uh, but we encourage, you know, all of our um, community organizations and organizations like yours to help us promote Kate. Um, and um, she's a very, um, uh, it's a very easy website to navigate and to pre-register. Uh, all we ask for is a first name, last name, and a phone number. Uh, no email is even required uh, to be able to pre-register. And when you come to one of our events, we're following all CDC guidelines. Uh, we're doing thermometer checks. We're doing hand sanitizer cleanups. Um, most of our bilingual community health workers are there to uh, help interpret and, and provide translation services on behalf of the uh, Penn State health nurses that we're working with. And uh, we're currently in the process of um, solidifying additional partnerships, uh, such as uh, local community colleges um, and so forth that, um, you know, hopefully we'll be able to come aboard uh, to help us uh, complete this type of work. We clearly have a long way to go. We're currently, um, uh, I believe, at stop number 12 out of the, out of the 120. Uh, so we clearly uh, will be on the road for the next few months. Next slide. So here I can talk a little bit more about the vaccination process for Kate. Uh, we are divided into uh, three zones. Next slide. Zone one is our registration area. Uh, zone one is when people arrive, they are guided to zone one for their registration. Uh, they will be requested to fill out the vaccine registration form and pre-vaccination checklist, which is a CDC requirement that pre-vaccination checklists ask questions like, are you allergic to, uh, to any type of medicine? Have you had COVID in the past 19 days? Have you had any type of um, you know, um, vaccination in the past 14 days and things like that? That is what we use to essentially determine if that person is qualified to receive the COVID-19 vaccination that day. Um, so that pre-vaccination checklist is extremely important to this process. Um, that is what we use to make sure that they are in good condition to receive the dose. Uh, each person receives a vaccination card along with educational information about the vaccine and a reminder card for their second shot if we are administering uh, the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine. Next slide. Here's a picture of our approved uh, Department of Health registration form. It's uh, meant to be very simple. It's meant to be one page. That way um, it's not scary and it's not um, over a, a 
some form of overburden uh, for um, you know the low income communities that we're going into. Uh, but then again, um, even if you don't have an ID, we do not require one uh, to be able to get the actual vaccination. And here towards the back, you see that picture of that pre-vaccination checklist as well. Next slide. And here we have some photos of those folks that allowed us to, that gave us permission to use some of their uh, pictures uh, being vaccinated. Um, in this picture, you have um, registered nurses who are essentially uh, performing the COVID-19 vaccine after all of their forms have been checked. You know, I have to be, I have to share with you the individual that we vaccinated, um, the oldest individual that we've vaccinated so far um, is a gentleman who was homebound. Um, his social worker um, saw the news on the TV and um, wanted to reach out and see if we could help. Um, and although we are not a homebound, uh, uh, you know, by any such way, shape, or form, this this agreement with the Department of Health does not allow us to go into homebound uh, homes. But we were able to get an exception because we had extra vaccines that day. And uh, this gentleman that you see here in this picture is 101 years old. Um, it's amazing that we were able to go into his home uh, with two nurses and uh, one of our team members. We literally drove to his home with all the necessary paperwork and the vaccine. And uh, he is 101 years old. Um, and we were able to get him his uh, first shot of uh, Moderna vaccine. It's a very fulfilling, uh, rewarding type of work. Um, and we're really excited to you know, be on this initiative in partnership with the Pennsylvania Department of Health. And um, the Pennsylvania Department of Health was not able to provide all the funding that we needed to, to effectively do this. So we were able to partner with our friends at Highmark and um, Highmark was able to provide additional dollars um, that, the, that the federal grant essentially would not cover. Um, next slide. Here's our zone three. Um, that, that bottom right picture that you're seeing there, uh, we were at a mushroom farm. Uh, everyone there actually gave us uh, permission to use their photo, believe it or not. They, they believe that um, being vaccinated is the, is the only way that we can return uh, to, to normal. Uh, so here in our zone three, which is our waiting area, patients wait roughly about 15 minutes after being vaccinated, 15 to 20 minutes after being vaccinated to ensure that no allergic reactions or secondary effects uh, are shown, uh, but can receive assistance if they do. At most of our events, we typically partner with a local EMS or a local ambulance unit. Um, most of the time, the lifeline is out there on behalf of Penn State. Um, otherwise, we're partnering with that local EMS uh, organization of wherever we're traveling to across the state. Next slide. Does that video play for you? Let's see if it plays for you. We wanted to give you guys a real live view of what is it that we do. Next slide. That's it. So I, I wanted to give you guys a real life view of you know um, how how we do this initiative while we're out on the road. Um, and I see that we have some questions in queue. Yeah. Thanks so much, George. Let's give George a round of applause. Great presentation, um, George. And um, yeah, there are uh, right now. There's two questions. Um, two questions in queue. Uh, first, what has been the most significant challenge in organizing the vaccination process? Um, well, out of the several challenges, we believe the the, the most significant challenge is essentially uh, convincing people to get the vaccine. There's a lot of hesitancy and a lot of education that still needs to be done, primarily in these low-income communities. 
Uh, many of these low-income communities um, don't have access to internet. Uh, many of them don't even have a television. Uh, therefore, they're not seeing the daily news that you and I are seeing. Um, and, um, you know, clearly there's a lot of stigma uh, around uh, communities of color, persons of color, uh, you know, uh, getting any type of vaccine. Uh, the J&J &J pause, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine pause has created uh, that hesitancy um, in a much, much greater level. Uh, we're seeing as high, after the J&J &J pause, we're seeing as high as a uh, 30 and 40% no-show rate uh, for people who were already pre-registered to get the vaccine. Uh, but yet, let alone, we are still currently over our goal of the number of people that we are to reach within our first few weeks. So I would say that is the, the, the largest uh, challenge that we are still um, uh, working on, to be honest with you. Thank you. you. I mean, you referenced a little bit, but I'll just kind of read the question. Um, I mean, can, is, there, is there more, I guess, is there more on that topic of hesitancy? The question is, can you speak to the underlying hesitancy within the Latino community in light of the high rate of impact of COVID-19? Um, yeah, and you know, um, I'll give you a quick example of a mother who came out uh, to an event last week, and um, we were administering Moderna vaccines, and uh, she wanted her children to be vaccinated along with her, um, and uh, it was a process to explain to her that you know, the, her children her age are not yet eligible for any type of vaccine. Um, and she felt that um, if her kids cannot get the vaccine before she does, then she's not ready to get the vaccine. So I think there's a lot of cultural barriers um, and educational barriers that need to, you know, uh, be had or be completed uh, prior to uh, successfully being able to reach the number of people that we need to reach. Um, a lot of that hesitancy um, also comes from the Latin American countries um, that we come from. Uh, vaccinations are truly just an option. Um, it's not a mandate, it's not a requirement. Um, when you have a, a number of children enrolling into schools, they typically are missing a very large number of vaccines uh, that are required in you know, the American school systems for, for children to go to school. Uh, so coming from Latin American countries and uh, you know, other type of countries where vaccines are truly an optional thing, um, Clearly, um, our, our, our challenges are much, much greater in um, vaccine uh, completion in these communities than any other uh, community uh, in general. Thank you. Thank you. Kate is great. Um, and uh, someone put a note, I guess Beth, you know, put in the note, Kate is great. Thank you, George. Um, I, I just kind of have a question. I mean, at some point, COVID will be over, right? or maybe not over, but you know, sufficiently that, well, we all hope. Um, is there, um, um, will Kate kind of, do you think serve a lifespan and then go on to do other things or, or is there a different, is there a, a, a longer term vision for Kate? Yeah, there definitely is a longer term vision for Kate. Um, you know, again, Kate, the, I see Bradley's question there. Uh, Kate stands for Community Accessible Testing and Education. Um, at that time, it was meant to just be a, a, a mobile testing unit. Uh, currently, Kate um, has agreements in roughly about 17 or 18 different counties across the state where we are still conducting COVID-19 testing. And on top of that, we are still doing, um, we just started doing COVID-19 vaccinations. Um, we believe that um, the term, the, the impact of COVID uh, will be around for anywhere between two to three years. Um, we're, we're not going to see a large success in the vaccination rates in Pennsylvania, uh, in my opinion, uh, no time soon. Um, you are starting to see some colleges and universities and even employers who are going to be requiring the vaccine in order for uh, you know, folks to get back to normal, whether it's in-person in learning or in-person office. Um, so we believe that Kate is going to be around for at least the next two to three years. Um, we hope that she's not around for too much longer, uh, because this is the, this is clearly not the type of work that we want to be doing uh, to, to, to keep our communities healthy. Uh, but Latino Connection is extremely passionate about this type of work, and uh, we wanted to be in the front line of defense um, as it related to this. And we're really thrilled and blessed that the Pennsylvania Department of Health 
uh, believed in our vision and gave us the opportunity to become certified. Um, and uh, Latino Connection recently became a vaccine provider, uh, a certified vaccine provider, which takes months to do. And we were able to do it in just shy of just a few days um, by bringing on a chief medical advisor, Dr. Rhonda Moore Johnson, who is our uh, chief medical advisor. She's based out of Pittsburgh and uh, we have multiple calls. Our, our days start as early as 3 and 4 a.m., or before they used to start as 8 or 9, uh, but we're very happy to be doing this type of work. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, George. You know, for anyone who maybe is not familiar with Latino Connection or, or um, you know, just to kind of, you know, um, make a, a broader uh, introduction, I guess, you know, beyond Kate and, and clearly the good work that you folks are doing in the area of COVID, um, just take a minute and talk about the scope. What all does Latino Connection do? Um, and what all do you do um, over there at Latino Connection? Yeah, absolutely. And, I, and I'd love to answer Joe's uh, question there before I, I, I talk a little bit more about Latino Connection really quick. Uh, can you review the assimilation of the influx from Puerto Rico from the hurricanes and where are most of Latinos coming, uh, coming to our community from? So um, after Hurricane Maria um, in 2017, 2017 or so, um, Florida was the number one state to see the largest uh, influx of Puerto Ricans and uh, state number two happened to be Pennsylvania. Um, Pennsylvania is a great place to be. Um, I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Uh, Pennsylvania is close to a very many metropolitan cities. The cost of living is great. School is great. The schools are great. Um, and um, very many Hispanic families uh, have families um, in Pennsylvania or have family members or friends in Pennsylvania in what we call the 222 corridor, which just expands from Franklin and Adams County into Dauphin, Lebanon, Lancaster, Berks County, and up into the Lehigh Valley region. Um, Lebanon uh, was the fastest growing county um, in the year of 2018, 2019. Um, and we're starting to see very large employers. Um, I mean, we recently partnered with giant food stores to translate their employee resource book into Spanish. Um, and um, if you don't know the rules, how can you follow them? You know, think, think of when you were in school, if you weren't taught to follow the rules, then how can you effectively follow them? So, um, you know, Latino Connection is extremely committed to helping employers and, and community organizations in Pennsylvania uh, to, help, uh, to help them become to par uh, with specific laws that are in place that many people um, are not aware of them. Um, if, you re if you are an entity that receives any type of federal uh, funding, um, it is the law that you have uh, language line access programs available uh, to communicate with folks in their native tongue, such as Spanish. Um, Latino Connection is essentially a social determinants of health agency. We provide high um, we provide high quality translation interpretation services. Uh, we currently are a team of roughly about 19 employees full-time and roughly about 35 part-timers and contractors uh, with different types of specialty. Um, we are the current agency that translates for Major League Baseball and Minor League Baseball as well. Um, so we have some national contracts and we have partnerships with organizations nationally like CVS Health CVS Health is one of our top uh, clients at Latino Connection, as well as Aetna. We work very closely with Highmark and Capital Blue Cross, um, just to kind of name a few. Um, so we're, we're, we essentially help a, uh, organizations understand and build strategic solutions to, to help them reach that growing demographic and minority communities of Pennsylvania, predominantly Latino. Well, thanks so much, George. And um, thanks for the great presentation. And, um, and for fielding some questions here, uh, we appreciate, we appreciate um, you sharing your time and perspective uh, with, um, with the Rotary Club of Harrisburg. Thank you so much. And you know, um, Kate is one of our mobile units. We have a total of five. Uh, so from 2018 to now, we went from one mobile unit to a total of five. So we're really thrilled to, you know, have partnerships with many of the, of the organizations that are that are here today. Um, and I'm just very humbled and um, appreciative of the invitation, Mary and Adeline. And thank you again, uh, Rotary Club of Harrisburg, for having me. I appreciate it. All right. Great.
Well, Rotary Club of Harrisburg, it's been another hour here on a Monday, hearing about some of the th uh, things that are front and center in our community. And um, we appreciate each one of you for being a part of our club. And um, I'm excited to think, you know, 110 more years of, um, of Rotary and what all will be done during that 110 years. Um, next week, Monday, May 10th. It is on the calendar as Monday, May 10th, next week. Meredith Mills, the Chief Operations Officer at Country Meadows will be our speaker. Um, she'll be talking about senior living during a pandemic. Don't miss that presentation. And, uh, and again, you know, if you didn't sign up for the birthday party tonight, you can still drop by. Uh, we'd enjoy seeing you there. We're meeting over at the Hilton at six o'clock at the Hill Society. So have a great Rotary week and we'll see you again next week.